Why is China so powerful, but yet it's not considered that cool and its culture not that important? You know, for us, it's important to me. But uh, yeah, let's just hear the analysis from this white Canadian guy, JJ. Interesting, because even though China is obviously the biggest and most politically powerful country in Asia, I feel like a lot of us don't really know all that much about Chinese culture relative to the culture of some of the other places on the continent. And there are a few reasons for that as far as I can see. One is just that China has been a poor country for quite a long time and doesn't have the same tradition of exporting high-end cultural goods to the West the way places like Japan and Korea do. That is starting to change as China gets richer, but even now, most of what China exports to the West are consumer goods manufactured on behalf of Western companies, as opposed to distinctly Chinese goods from Chinese brands. Boom, Andrew, cultural analyst from Canada, JJ McCullough just dropped a video, Chinese culture is cool and important. And I'll tell you this, Andrew, for a non-Chinese guy or a non-Asian guy, this is one of the most interesting videos I've seen trying to understand China. Yeah, I thought he did a good job and I thought thought he did his research. He was, uh, his tone was very, you know, unbiased, very neutral. And, you know, I think it was very sincere. So honestly, this was a good video. There's a bunch of crazy comments and these comments get really, really long and analytical. So we're gonna try to break this video down, guys. So please hit that like button, check out other episodes of the Hot Pop Boys. Hey, but you know what is cool that is influenced by Chinese culture? What? Smala. Whoa! You get on Amazon right now. It's got great ratings, smallassauce.com. Real quick, let's just talk about this, Andrew. Do you agree with this general premise that in the Western world, which has more global hegemony and most people think Western, right, in the world, most people think in the Western Anglosphere, cultural sphere, that despite China being very economically important and maybe militarily important, its culture is not considered important and its pop culture is certainly almost unknown. Okay, so I would say this that I think even from a Western lens, or maybe I would say educated Western lens, that people see obviously China as an important country. It's culture as having permeated a lot of the globe in different ways, but it's pop culture definitely not considered that cool. And China, maybe the word cool is not the best word to describe China or Chinese culture. I think that's how the West perceives it. I think that JJ did a pretty good job. This guy is a culture geek. I know he's not Chinese, but ultimately, listen, it's important to hear smart non-Asians or non-Chinese analyze China. You know, I, from a, actually, because there's Chinese scholars that we could listen to and pro-Chinese people. Yeah, but, let me take you through the history of the Tang Dynasty and uh, how they exported all around the sinusphere. Yeah. But uh, I would say this, would you agree that all ABC should watch this video? I think they should, but Andrew, guess what? I don't think that they will because I think that a lot of ABCs, American-born Chinese, maybe Canadian-born Chinese, we know that Chinese culture is considered like esoteric and not cool in a, in a grandma way and like maybe, uh, or a motherly way, or I don't know. And then like Japan and Korea are more like the cool, trendy kids of Asia. You know what I mean? Like, but that maybe they birthed some of their culture from the mother or the grandmother, but it's like, we just don't really care about analyzing it how JJ is, right? right. Like I'm saying, we don't think about it in terms of like, hey, why isn't China cool? We just kind of like accept it. Well, I think always wondering why China is not cool is more of a question that would, I guess, somebody from China would probably spend more of their life thinking about that question. No, no, Versus, no, somebody from China living in the West. Yeah, but but an Asian American who sees himself as American, for example, that's where, hence, this kind of like Asian American culture comes from, whether it's boba or AZN culture, you know what You're I mean? you talking about like, lambdas and KD5s. Yeah, and this friend. kind of blending of Southeast Asian and East Asian cultures and then blending it with- But a it is kind of sinospheric, actually, that blending. It is, it is, but I'm saying like, to sit there and ponder why Chinese culture is not cool is definitely something for very, like, I guess, uh, more Chinese thinking people. People with the time and the, I guess the intellectual curiosity to do so. But sure. guess who has that? Ding, 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 ding. We do. Woo. Um, I think the thing was like, we never fully leaned into like AZN culture. I, I like AZN culture. I go to, I, I was a fan of arena nightclub. You know what I mean? Amongst other clubs, whisper parties when those were around. Uh, 
in New York. But like at the end of the day, I understand that this is a real question. And I think it's something that is important to ask. Let's just get into his reasons, Andrew. Let's just go one by one. He says, China- wait, wait, this is to answer why Chinese culture is not considered that cool in the West. Yes, yes, yes. So JJ's first reason, Andrew, was that China, your average person in China has been poor throughout much of modern history. Okay. So, and he's saying that typically poor people do not just like really have, like people do not have their eye on poor people. Like when we think about even Japan or something like that, it's like the samurais, people who were high up. People don't study like the Burakumin, like uh, untouchables in Japan, mm, mm-hmm. right? Um, but I will say this, I would argue this, that South Korea, Andrew, was actually very, very poor for a very, very long time in Asia, but has had such a crazy come up over the past 30, 40, 50 years right. that I don't know if just being poor is enough to say that's why it's not cool. Mm, yes, there was a lot of poor countries. And I think that, you know, for example, I think Korea's uh, rise, or I guess like um, when they started creating an exporting culture, it came at the right time. So You mean a time of globalization yeah but china was always china with or without the west to an extent right to an extent china was going to be china so china never had to cater and think about what people on the outside thought china was this big country that kind of could exist mostly on its own essentially doing its own thing so it was not forced to be cool right Right, right, right. Well, yeah. I mean, uh, a lot of people talk about places like India or Brazil almost uh, living in their own cultural sphere and not needing to be part of like a globalized Mm. sphere of culture, right? Um, He also says, point number two, much of Chinese history in North America for the past hundred years has been defined by lower middle class immigrants catering to the westernized white middle class. Mm. Well, uh, be more specific here. So basically he's saying that if you look at the immigration patterns until very recently, maybe the last decade, maybe the last two decades, depending on if you're in Vancouver, Canada, where he is, it's probably been happening for three decades, where he's basically saying like, for the most part, if you look at the immigration waves, it was lower middle class people from China coming to the West and doing whatever they needed to do to survive, which was often either catering to their own population in a Chinatown or opening laundromats and quick service Chinese takeouts for a middle-class white American. Well, I would add on to that. I don't fully disagree with that because obviously if you think about, you know, if you just look at Chinatowns, right? Chinatowns are a great place for commerce, community food, all this stuff, but they are absolutely immigrant enclaves. They are absolutely lower middle class, generally immigrant enclaves, at least the people who live there. Well, they, they, and they probably have still are that to this day. Yeah, but, but I will add on to this that even since 1965, when a lot of Chinese, for example, whether it's Taiwanese, Chinese, Hong Kongese, uh, students came over, which part of our family is part of, I'm saying- You're talking about Heart Seller. Yeah, the Heart Seller Act, those students- Maybe they didn't have a lot of money, but they were not necessarily the poverty immigrants. They were coming here to get educated. So, so what I'm saying is you do have the lower middle class immigrants coming here to work and just make a living for themselves. Everything from the railroad, the gold rush over on to, you know, servers in Chinatown. But also we have a lot of kind of, I would say, brain workers or essentially Chinese nerds that came over. And so between- I would say post 1970 though. Right, but between the geeky- First of all, nothing wrong with being a geek, guys. So I got, you know, this is a lot of our family, by the way. So I'm just saying, I'm just using the word educated, geeky minds of Asia with the lower class minds of Asia as well, or I mean, from China. So then those two groups are not considered the coolest. Those are not the swag lord 3000s. Right. And I don't think they came over to be cool. They came over for opportunities for just a better life and to study and, you know, become engineers, for example. But Unfortunately, in America, being an engineer is not considered that cool. Useful, though. You need it to turn the economic wheel. But yes, in America. I wish it was cooler. Uncool. I wish being an engineer I, was I considered cooler. I wouldn't say in China it's necessarily like cooler than being Jackson Wang either, but it's not as dumped on. Yeah, because there's just not, I think the process of cool is not, it's not uh, such a hard, what well, people aren't so judgmental of being cool in China. Um, He also goes on to say that 21st century Chinese history was marked by a lot of confusion and arguing and even war over 
what even is true Chinese culture? So, Andrew, we're not even talking about the situation in the West. We're talking about in China, they couldn't even figure out what was Chinese culture. Right. But uh, what is this attributed to mostly? I mean, that's well, what- China is gigantic. Right. It is not as easy to find as what Japan or Korea is. Like Their histories are way more, I guess, simple to understand. Right. Like China's history is like incredibly convoluted. And it's very like, do, do people say... Uh, Manchu or like Mongolian led dynasties, do those count as Han right, dynasties? Right? right? And then like there was a bunch of stuff that came in from because the Mongolians, they were homies with uh, all the Tatar looking people from, so, the, so, middle, right. like, from the Western I, steps and they came down and like, what's going on? Right. So I guess, for example, a question might be what dynasty defines the best Chinese culture? Is it the Tang dynasty, which is considered, I guess, the most coolest, right. best? Han Song, there or, was the, a couple- or the Song dynasty? Uh, is it not the latest Qing dynasty? Because I was more what Manchurian, which right, is, and they made uh, they made all the Han guys wear the little uh, cues. Right. So, which so are, what? That, those ca- are not cool. So we so we don't count the Qing dynasty, for example. And then what is it? It's not like the Cultural Revolution because then they did away with a lot of the older right. Chinese culture because it was more like the Cultural Revolution. But so we don't know. Like I guess what is agreed upon, right? We don't fully know. Here's the complicated thing about China, Andrew. As recent as in the past hundred years, they picked Mandarin to be the national language. And Shanghainese, Cantonese, and Fujianese, I believe, placed all in the top five. So I'm saying that it's like, we didn't even know that Mandarin was gonna be the language that we were all supposed to speak until the past hundred years. Well, you know, sometimes in history, there's a group of guys who make hard decisions. <laughs> and the decision they made was to pick Mandarin. Um, Mandarin was pretty cool. It, it wasn't bad. It wasn't hey, bad. Hey, four tones, a little bit easier to learn than eight. I'm not going to lie. Mad. I'm not mad. But yeah, I mean, there's pros and cons of every dialect. Um, he points to the Cultural Revolution, 1966 to 1976. And basically, Andrew, what he was kind of trying to say is like, this was Mao, by the way, I'm saying he did a bunch of bad stuff too during this time. But this was him trying to figure out what was Chinese culture. Like, basically, everybody was arguing between these provinces, northwest, east, south, which history is the real history because the capital moved so many times. So, Ma was like, yeah, we're just going to, like, do it this way, like, based right. off the Russian style. Right, and that, that obviously, there's a lot of downsides to that, too. It wipes out a lot, but, like, a, a lot of stuff is forgotten. They moved on from a lot of tradition. Uh, a lot of it, people say, is more contained in, like, Taiwan and the diaspora, whether it's Malaysia, Singapore. Right, places any- where they, they left before the Cultural Revolution. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. But uh, I guess that was definitely one of the intentions of it, yes. Right, right. I mean, there's an argument, too, that the Manchurians actually destroyed a lot of traditional Chinese culture. That was even before communism happened. Um, Basically, there was a feeling, though, he goes back to say even pre-communism, there was a feeling amongst the Chinese elites that traditional Chinese culture was just a burden. Mm. Like, this is even in 1910. Like, they were looking at the rest of the world. Japan was, like, get going, learning all this stuff from England and France, like, just getting Germany, getting super advanced. And then the Chinese were just like, yeah, like, maybe we should, like, just use some inventions that we didn't create. Because, you know, for a while, I think that China was kind of stuck on, Andrew, things that they created. Right, right, right. Right. Like, if they didn't create it, they didn't want it. Um, So now, then he goes on to say that the Chinese middle class right now in 2024, Andrew, is trying to attempt to reclaim certain parts of ancient Chinese culture from hundreds and thousands of years ago, but they're being selective about it, but also that the CCP has a very large guiding hand in that journey. Right. Yeah. So we're trying to figure it out. So basically, Andrew, what he did is he took a, a look at all these minions from Pop Mart China. Basically, these minions are meant to be sold to middle-class Chinese. And he is using these as the markers of what he believes will be pushed as Chinese culture moving forward. Mm, interesting. So you're looking at the toys and what uh, Chinese marketers, I guess, you know, have decided that would sell are sellable aspects of Chinese culture. At least internally, domestically, to a Chinese domestic consumer market. All right, number one, Andrew. He's got candied Hawthorne Tom, a.k.a. Tom selling Tang Hu Lu's. Mm, Okay. All right, so interestingly enough, Andrew, Tang Hu Lu's really define Northern China. Right. People really eat them in the wintertime. Tang Hu Lu's, they're trendy now. You could do them with grapes and whatever like that. But interestingly enough, Andrew, lychees are the Tang Hu Lu of the South. Oh. Because lychee is uh, the one of the only fruits that is native to Guangzhou. Makes sense. So basically, it kind of goes to show you there that there is a completely different defining fruit in the north and the south. Right. But obviously, right now, the capital is in Beijing. So 
northern things are more going to have, I guess, what, higher priority, Andrew, than southern things? Mm -hmm. Okay, moving on, Andrew. Chinese calligraphy, Dave. Okay. Basically, he says that he, as a Western person, feels that Chinese calligraphy is one of the absolute coolest undisputed parts of Chinese culture. Yeah, I think uh, Chinese language and calligraphy in particular is cool. Obviously, a lot of people get tattoos. A lot of non-Chinese, non-Asians will get Chinese calligraphy tattoos. I think it, it's a cool way of writing, you know? Yeah. And I think people do have, whether it be shallow or deep, they have an appreciation for it. Uh, Andrew, there are five to six major styles of calligraphy. You could go oracle bone, seal, clerical, cursive, semi-cursive, standard. I'm going to go ahead and say this, Andrew. I think Chinese probably have the best looking calligraphy of their own language. But mm -hmm. I will say this, Japanese calligraphy has a very hyper loose style that is really cool looking for tattoos, but sometimes it is unintelligible to the eye what kanji they are even trying to write. So, are Chinese characters cool or not? Let us know in the comments down below. I would say Tang Hulu is cool. Yeah. But specifically with non hawthorn berry fruits though. Shout out to the traditional hawthorn berry, but like I, I like the grapes and the tangerines. Uh, by the way, Andrew, here's an ancient Chinese book from 600 years ago. Here's an ancient Japanese book. As you can see, they have looser calligraphy. This is Korean hanja. Uh, it looks a little bit more Aztecan, the way they used to write the Chinese characters. And this is Vietnamese Chu Nam, Andrew, from like, I don't even know, 500 years ago. That actually looks like really interesting, mm. like a hieroglyphic version of Chinese characters. Um, those are the countries that were in the Sinosphere that used the Chinese language at some point for their culture. Um, anyway, he also goes on to say that the CCP simplified Chinese to make to increase the literacy rate because the traditional characters have too many strokes and are too complicated. Yeah. Um, he also talks about radicals. By the way, guys, there is a Chinese radical system that allows you to... Uh, to tell you the meaning of a character, but it's only about 70% accurate on the mm. radical system. Next up, number three, Andrew, there's Shanghai Restoration Tom and Peking Opera Stewart. Mm. Look at these funny minions. Yeah, well, I think it's this is referring to the times of, I guess, theater or entertainment, obviously Shanghai being the more... Uh, uh, relevant or I guess recent hub of culture back in like the 20s and 30s, right? But then before that, also like, the Peking Opera, like, I guess he also mentions that the Peking Opera, while it is a part of Chinese culture, is to, in today's world not considered very cool. I don't think it's cool. I'm not, I don't really go against it, but I remember going to many Peking Opera for performances when I was young, and I'm just glad that not all the performers are male anymore. Can't say that I oh, yeah. am into the Peking Opera. All right, all right. I got an interesting point. I'm here. into the Shanghai 1930s, right. though. Ni dong shu ni hui lai. Do you think that the 1930s westernized Shanghainese Pearl of the Orient jazz show tunes music is similar to how K-pop or Japanese uh, 2000s R&B is popular? Because it was essentially Western music with slight Chinese sonic influences and Chinese lyrics. Uh, yeah, but, but K-pop is a lot more popular now. So I, I do think that, uh, I mean, I also think more of this time was, uh, from the Western viewpoint, more focused on like Chinese women, you know, to be honest. So I think that, I think a lot of the songs are sang by women. That's well, the they're, And they're kind of suggestive too. Yeah. It was kind of the beginning of perhaps... I guess, romanticizing Chinese women, which comes right. with its pros and cons, of course. Uh, By the way, guys, I don't even want to say this, but they also called it the more of the Orient too, not just the Pearl of the Orient. I, I can't say the word. I don't want to get demonetized. H-O-R of the Orient at the time, Shanghai, because it was colonized. Yeah, so I do think that this played a part into it, but uh, made for some good music. Oh, Interestingly enough, Andrew, our grandparents lived slightly through this 1930 Shanghai period. Shout out to Zhao Tong Dashua. Um, moving on, Kung Fu Hammer Phil. Andrew, is Kung Fu cool? Has it seen its peak or is it still cool? Uh, Kung Fu is still considered cool, I think in an entertainment aspect. I think from uh, a practical standpoint, a lot of debate is out there, but also I just think in general, I mean, all martial arts works and all martial arts don't work. At the same time. All right, so, what do you think about this statement? He said, Chinese martial arts are oftentimes thought to be more artistic, less brutal, and more philosophical, more peaceful, and more flowy than even other Asian martial arts. That is, I would say, a general accurate sentiment towards Chinese Kung Fu. You're talking about Shaolin, Wing Chun. 
Yeah, like a lot of these are uh, considered more art forms in the modern day rather than a form of actual combat. Uh, although there are other Asian forms of combat that are more effective that like have been developed Like Muay Thai recently. or something like that. Well, Sanda, uh, which oh, San, is a Chinese... Sanda Sancho, right? Yeah, which is Chinese kickboxing was developed by the army, but um, yeah. Anyways. Um, yeah, I would say that Kung Fu is still considered cool. Even though I would say that recently with the advent of MMA, people were questioning its combat usefulness, right? Uh, Game of Go Bob is the next minion. Andrew, how familiar are you with the, the Game of Go, Chinese Go? Uh, not that familiar, but because of this video, I definitely looked up how to play it. And uh, yeah, I mean, Go, it's cool that Chinese, I guess, have an ancient board game. That we is, have Chinese chess too, though. Yeah, also Chinese chess too. So we have multiple board games. So... I think, yeah, I mean, is Go cool? It's not really known, so I guess I wouldn't say it's cool. I just went into a boba shop the other day called Si Yi Andrew that looks like a game of Go. Mm. So it's actually an aesthetic thing, too. The white and the black, it looks like uh, calligraphy on a white piece of paper. So, yeah, shout out to the game of Go. Let us know if you guys know. I heard it's very complex. Um, interestingly enough, Andrew, it kind of goes to show you the way the East and the West thinks because in the game of Go, you don't really get dominated and kill the king, right, like mm -hmm. in chess. What do you do? You just try to like entrap each other and then one person just like gives up. Next up, Andrew, you've got Terracotta Warrior Kevin. Mm -hmm. um, this is talking about Qing Shi Huang, uh, 221 to 210 BC, Andrew. This is China in 200 BC. This is Greece in 200 BC. Um, in the Jet Li's movie Hero, Andrew, he's about to assassinate Qing Shi Huang and he lets him go and lets him unite China despite Jet Li getting killed at the end of the movie. Dang. Uh, yeah, I think terracotta soldiers are pretty cool. I mean, I guess just maybe Chinese warriors in general. I don't think, because I think terracotta warriors isn't that referring to exactly the clay warriors. Yeah, those are the 6,000 clay warriors that got buried with Qing Shi Huang when he died. Right. That's they what go the with him to the afterlife because they believed in that back then. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I guess, uh, I mean, I think warrior culture is always considered cool in any culture. So I, I just don't think that uh, the Chinese warrior culture, it's not exactly like if you're like European or like, you know, from the, uh, you're thinking about the Vikings. Like it's not the same. Like the yeah. Vikings is considered, they're more considered more savage, but also I guess better fighters. I would say the only Chinese warrior, I mean, East Asian or Asian warrior culture I see put on a pedestal is samurais. Yeah. Right. But uh, if you guys know about like, when and Wu masculinity in China. We're just in a when cycle right now, so the Wu guys kind of get downplayed. And, you know, shout out to Guan Yu. Anyway, um, next up, we've got Flying High Stewart, Andrew, who has a swallow kite on his back. Mm -hmm. Basically, that is just a... Uh, Chinese invented a lot of different types of kites. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, I always said my the Chinese box kite was my favorite. Mm. Hot Pot Bob. Andrew, would you say that... Uh, yeah. I mean, this is the history of Hot Pot. It's not fully clear, but Sichuan now has the most famous Hot Pot that's exportable. Yeah, yeah, I think, a lot, I think this is a pretty cool, I think Hot Pot is cool. I think people think Sichuan food is cool as far as food goes. Right. Interestingly enough, Andrew, the hua jiao, the, like the, the little circular peppercorn is native to Sichuan. However, the red and the green peppers were brought by Spanish and Portuguese traders from South America. Mm -hmm. Andrew, next up, we've got Tiger Ride and Dave. That is true. The Chinese love them some tigers. Yeah, tigers. Tigers are cool. You know, it's funny because in Chinese culture, they also kind of revere the panda. But I want to say that's maybe more of a recent thing. I'm not sure. Somebody in the comments who knows more about this, let me know. But like the fixation with the panda is more of a reason because pandas yep. don't do anything. They're not fierce animals. Well, would you say that pandas and tigers both come, come from China? Well, I think pandas more exclusively tigers were all around the Asian seaboard, but I'm saying that like, they couldn't, you couldn't think of two more opposite animals. Dude, a tiger's almost the fiercest hunter in the jungle pound for pound. Yeah, and pandas are on the opposite end. So, yeah, I think those maybe that's the duality. Maybe that's the yin and the yang, man, the panda and the uh, tiger. By the way, Andrew, they said that most tigers, it's not a 100 out of 100, would beat a lion in a battle to the death because tigers are better at fighting. Uh, by the way, here is the historic distribution of tigers, Andrew, all the way from Siberia. We got Korea all the way down to China, Vietnam, Southeast Asia, and India. 
So that's pretty cool. I didn't even know that that's where all tigers came from. Uh, Stone Lion Carl. Andrew, he's talking about the foo dogs or the she she or the I believe that's what it's called. And uh, yeah, you see these Andrew most famously now in front of casinos in Las Vegas and on dudes forearms as tattoos. AZN guys is food. Yeah, AZN. Uh, Lion Dance Stewart. Andrew, this is pretty obvious, right? Because you see a lot of lion dancing near Chinese New Year. It's more of a southern practice. Yeah, uh, but yeah, I mean, lion dance, it's a. Uh... Lion dance teams in America and in the Western world have been a source of community for a lot of people and uh, kind of of like uh, competition amongst each other. So, yeah, I guess lion dancing, uh, kind of cool, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I would say, you know, it's really interesting if you, like I said, one of the hardest things about Chinese culture is that it's so diverse because like you could grow up in a part of China even for like hundreds of years. Let's just say you had like a 900-year lifespan. You're like a you know, Highlander or whatever. I'm saying that you might not ever have seen lion dancing based on the province that you were living your life in. And last but not least, Andrew, we've got Bamboo Flute Bob with a panda hat on. Mm -hmm. And he's playing a uh, dizi. And yeah, basically this Chinese flute, Andrew, is that like, like, you know, like you just play that music every time something Chinese pops up in a movie or a video game. Right. Um, yeah, I would say, and he also goes on to say, Andrew, the Chinese culture was built on bamboo because they were using bamboo in China before the nation state concept of China even existed. Yeah, man. And uh, I had to look it up. They said that Japan was built on a volcano because there's a lot of sulfur. Korea was built on granite. Vietnam was built on rice paddies and Thailand was built on river basins. Woo. Yeah. So it goes to show you there's different elements yeah, no, I mean, definitely geography, climate, and environment help define culture. All right, let's just get into the comment section, Andrew. Um, somebody said, totally agree. I always felt the Chinese culture, while widely recognized, still doesn't get its due because it's not seen as hip or trendy as Japanese or Korean culture. I just really admire all the cultural innovation the Chinese have come up with through the millennia, which has had a major impact on the region and the world. So I would say this, I would say that, it's just interesting because China's like impact is sort of like ancient Rome. But Andrew, where do you see China headed in the future? Because obviously being cool is about the last, what, 150 years of world globalized society. And, yeah. when, and in that past 150 years, China didn't do so good until now. Well, uh, you know, it's going to be in part on people to kind of choose which parts of uh, culture that they want to keep. And obviously parts of the culture that are easily sellable will stick around more because we live in primarily even if you're in asia mostly a capitalistic global society where you know you want to sell something if it can make you money you're gonna more likely keep it around i'm not saying people don't keep things around that don't make the money but ultimately if you can sell something it's gonna be more relevant i think to i've life. been in a commercialized hot pot spot andrew recently where everybody was wearing panda suits there was chinese kites hanging from the wall and they were playing the deeds of flute bamboo flute music yeah do you and know what i'm saying i'm saying they stacked all the things that jj just talked about into one thing for sure i mean look at the things that people are hanging on to those are the things that people think are cool right um basically i'm just gonna pop up a bunch of hyper detailed breakdowns from like a lot of people because you know jj mccullough even though he analyzed sort of these minion sets from pop mart he, he didn't really come up with a conclusion but a lot of other people basically said you know it's just gonna take time and it's gonna be interesting to see what comes up in the future but it's coming mm -hmm. because right now you know maybe like a lot of things are just like innovative versions of things that other people are known for mm. right um Ultimately, here's my takeaways. I think that this is an important video. I do think that most ABCs don't think about this. I think they've given up on trying to contribute to this in any sort of way, but it's something that crosses my mind sometimes. So I got to give props to JJ McCullough. I thought it was a good video. Yeah, and uh, overall, I mean, I, I think that, uh, you know, there's aspects I think that are cool about Chinese culture, whether it's language, cooking, ideals about hard work harmony these are things that people kind of brag about like what what are the things about chinese culture that people actually kind of can brag about like hey i don't wear shoes in the house hey we got some uh cool historical fashion you know with the cheap how and then you kind of have like uh maybe trying to make baijiu cool right now which is we'll see what happens but possibly and i think that man uh i don't think chinese culture is gonna ever be the coolest to a 
basic thinking person because I think basic people, they're not looking at history, which is not fully wrong because, you know, you live in the present. But I do think that people who are going to more think from a historical context or look back at history, which it is a more kind of geeky or intellectual thing to do, they will find more appreciation for China. But in the most recent sense, it's just not going to be as cool compared to other things. Right. I mean, I always say this. I've flown, you know, Korea Air, Japan Air, different airlines back to Asia. I've been to all the a lot of Asian countries. And I, it's always interesting, Andrew, when you're on a flight to Korea, you see a lot of like trendy young people wearing like hip fashion. When you are on a pl flight to Japan, you see people reading animes or mangas. And when I was on a flight to China direct from the US before, I saw a bunch of white people that were obsessed with Dungeons and Dragons, like super ancient, like esoteric, Eric, you know, I mean, like things from like a thousand years ago type right. thing. So anyway, guys, let us know what you think in the comment section below. What's going to be cool from Chinese culture popping up? Obviously, it's coming up now. It's got a lot of stuff that it didn't have 10 years ago, 20 years ago, but it is behind the curve in terms of appealing to the West or you could argue even figuring itself out to itself. Until next time, we the Hop Hop Boys. We out. Peace. Peace.